This is Live Well Talk on Electrophysiology. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unipoint Health St. Luke's Hospital. Joining me today is Dr. Wee Wee Lee, cardiologist with St. Luke's Heart Care Clinic to discuss electrophysiology, or as we call it in the business, EP, uh, which is a specialized field, and I think the listeners are going to find this very interesting, uh, that includes uh, how pacemakers and defibrillators are used uh, in the practice of medicine. Uh, We have one of the most technologically advanced uh, electrophysiology labs uh, in the state, and we're very proud of it, and welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for uh, giving me this opportunity to um, basically uh, introduce the idea or background about electrophysiology and uh, what's the uh, function of electrophysiologist, what do we do to um, provide uh, patient care and uh, serve our community. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, So if you could describe electrophysiology, how would you describe it? I mean, I think most people, they know what a pacemaker is, right? In order to have an idea of it. Yeah. A smaller segment of the population probably knows what a defibrillator is. Yeah. But tell us in your words, what what is electrophysiology? You know, when I hear a nurse calling patient, the most common word they use is electrophysiologist is electrician. And I think it describes pretty well and um, it's a subspecialty in the cardiology uh, group. And, uh, you know, the heart muscle uh, control the pumping function of the heart. But those activities really depending on electrical system. If the electrical system is messed up, diseased, injured, or have a genetic disease, then it's gonna affect how the heart works. And the patient can have slow heart rate, too fast heart rate, passing out, stroke. Uh, most of those um, like uh, arrhythmias, they're not uh, life-threatening, but there's certain can cause really uh, serious complications, heart failure, stroke, fainting, or cardiac death. And uh, the function of an electrophysiologist is to study those um, patients, identify, confirm the diagnosis, and uh, use the state-of-the-art treatment to help uh, cure those problems. We're yeah. electrician. Yeah, it, it, yeah. There's a lot of cool toys. You yes. Know, there really is. Yes. Um, now, you did a cardiology, internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship. And then how much training did you go beyond just being a cardiologist to become an electrophysiologist? I think all the training is about a decade, like a medical Ten school. Years. Yep. Internal medicine. And after internal medicine, you have to have at least a five-year cardiology training, including general cardiology and electrophysiologist. Wow. So it's decades of training. And then we need to be board certified before we're practicing. And every 10 years, we have to be board certified to make sure we're updated with all the current knowledge so that we're competent to com- continue to uh, yeah, be a function. Y- you know, as someone that's also in a board certification track where I have to do it every 10 years, um, and you know, a lot of the public doesn't know that. You know, but it is important, and I do think it keeps up your skills and keeps you reading, keeps you learning, um, and I think it is important. Uh, and but a lot of a lot of the public doesn't know that uh, how much reading doctors do when they're in practice. It's called a practice. You're still learning all the time. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Especially uh, EP field is uh, rapidly evolving, and then every year. Uh, basic research and uh, clinical research guidelines um, industry provide us with new tools, mapping techniques. We constantly have to learn in order for us to keep up with the newest technology. And though all those things are needed to improve our patient care. So constant learning. So the public's going to understand what a pacemaker is, I think. Um, may or may not know what a defibrillator is, but could you tell us what, what procedures do you do? Yep, you know, we do uh, a very broad uh, aspect of uh, procedures. Uh, for example, patients have slow heart rate. If we don't find any reversible causes and then they're symptomatic, then they will need a pacemaker to speed up the heart rate. For people who had a cardiac arrest or very increased risk of sudden cardiac death, we offer defibrillator. Defibrillator is like you carry a little ambulance on you. Instead of waiting for ambulance to come, the little device will identify the bad rhythm and terminate it within five seconds. And then we see patients who have syncope or stroke, 
nobody can figure out why they keep passing out, had a stroke. We can implant in a long-term loop recorder. It can monitor heart rhythm for three or four years, so that hoping we can identify etiology for syncope or stroke. And then majority of the procedure focusing on, I shouldn't say majority, a lot of the procedure focusing on ablation, which is very uh, state-of-the-art uh, studies, uh, precisely, very precise study to identify the etiology of the rhythm trouble, uh, particularly uh, fast beat, whether it's tachycardia in the upper chamber, tachycardia in the lower chamber, atrial fibrillation, and then we located the focus of the area, and then we used uh, radio frequency energy or cryo energy, and there were even more uh, ablation energy uh, sources coming up, and then to cause a little scar tissue in the heart. The goal is really to prevent this happening, and a lot of these procedures is curative, and this is the beauty of the electrophysiologist. Yeah, there is there is a s sense of satisfaction after you're done. Yes. But... Now, let the caveat here is that people that your procedures can be long. You can be in that, that lab for a long time. That's correct. And then sometimes um, we have to have this rhythm happening before we know where it's coming right. from. And then it takes time to induce this rhythm. And then we, we cannot really do much until we really see the rhythm happening. So sometimes people do complain they're awake during the procedure. And we really cannot make them too comfortable until we have this rhythm happen. Right. And then we know where it is, then we can cure the problem. Yeah. So, you, so you, you right now use either cold energy or hot energy to get rid of. I, what I tell patients when they're in that situation, yeah. I say your, your, your heart has a short in the wiring. Yes. And they're going to go in and fix the wiring. Yes. You know, and that and people can understand. Yes, that, that's that's very uh, yes, can understand with that yeah description yeah. An another service you guys uh, provide which uh, a lot of listeners are going to know the, what it is. That's atrial fibrillation, and we have the new Watchman procedure for that. Um, the people, the listeners that have atrial fibrillation, everybody knows someone that does. It's very common. Uh, they have to be on blood thinners, and that's a downer. Uh, I mean, we had Coumadin, Warfarin. You had to have your INR checked. Uh, now we have the novel agents. You don't have to have your blood tested, but you're still on a blood thinner. But the Watchman relieves that. Tell us what the Watchman procedure is. You know, uh, Watchman is a really, I think, a great, a really great uh, intervention uh, procedures uh, for people who need to take uh, anticoagulation to minimize the risk of a stroke. A lot of patients, they're, they have bleeding risk. They bleed by their uh, central nervous system bleeding, GI bleed, or they keep falling. So taking a blood thinner is very risky. Um, although it does offer risk for uh, stroke prevention. So for those people who need to take a blood thinner, but very high risk of bleeding, risk of fall, and uh, we offer Watchman device. This is a little device, it's a one-time procedure, and we implant it in the heart to occlude the area that can potentially causing cloud forming. And then people do not need to take a blood thinner afterwards. So this is one-time procedure to replace a blood thinner lifelong. And then this really uh, uh, special for people who just cannot tolerate anticoagulation. And this is also part of the procedure we do um, as an electrophysiologist. And I think some intervention cardiologists also do this procedure. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that. To me, that is one of the most revolutionary things that's come out of cardiology in the recent years. Yes. Uh, just knowing so much about anticoagulation and all, all the burden that that is for a patient. I, I really think the watchman is revolutionary. Yes. Um, I mean, the you know, the defibrillators and all that cool stuff, you know, that you're building on technologies. The watchman is def is revolutionary and it's changing people's lives for the better. Correct. Now, with the new expansion that we're doing out on the west end of the campus, how is that going to impact electrophysiology? You know, we're... Um we have so many patients have this heart rhythm trouble. And then uh, um, it's really good that we build another lab. And then we'll have another physician join us next year, middle of next year. And so that we can uh, 
help a patient care on a timely fashion because we don't want the patient to wait a few months for us to do the procedure. Once we identify the problem, we rather take care of the problem right away instead of waiting. And then once we build a new lab, uh, we will have better or newer tools. And then we can, uh, both lab are gonna have a really good mapping system and we can do multiple procedures at the same time. So it's really, I think, a help uh, serve the community. Oh, so the, not only will the space be new, but the technology you're using will also be new. We'll have new uh, tools yeah, oh, wow. coming. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now, let's talk about, let's go through some unique things that I want to learn about here. The the leadless pacemaker, the pacemaker without a wire that you just put in there. Yeah. Can you tell us? Because I know you've done, I've had a patient yes, where you've yeah. done them. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Yes. So uh, this technique coming uh, due to the demand. There were patients, for example, dialysis patient. They have catheters on one side, the other side is occluded, they have fistula. We don't have vascular access to implanting pacemaker. And then uh, the industry is very uh, uh, creative. And then they have this leadless pacemaker. We can go from the groin and then go inside the heart. And then the current one we're doing is inside in the bottom chamber. So it can pace the bottom chamber. And then, um, and then the lead, there's no lead there. So basically a little device sitting in the bottom chamber, it will pace the bottom chamber. And we don't worry about vascular access. And then this is also useful for people who um, have an ongoing infection. And then by putting a transvenous, there is much higher risk right. of infection. So lower risk of infection. Yes. Okay, that makes lower, sense. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yes. And then defibrillator traditionally is transvenous uh, defibrillator. You have to go through the shoulders and then lead inside the heart. And then we have subcutaneous defibrillator. There's no lead going into the bloodstream. And the, the defibrillator generator sit under the armpit. And then that will also, just like a little ambulance, it does not pace the heart, but it will shock and terminate a lethal arrhythmia if needed. Yeah, it's like yeah. having your own defibrillator, yes. AED. You know? Yes, yes. Uh, I, this, 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 I saw a patient, I had a patient I, I took care of once that, w this is prior to cell phones, you couldn't take a picture of it, but he had the, like the original pacemaker that was on the outside of the heart, the original defibrillator, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was, the x-ray was bizarre. You know, yeah. I've never, that's the only patient in my 25 years, 27 years that I've actually yeah. seen like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, he said it went off once and he was hunting and he thought he got shot and then he realized that's what it was. But yeah, it was, that was, the technology has come a long way. It's very rapidly. Uh, if you look at the old um, picture of pacemaker defibrillator compared with current generation or even this lead list pacemaker, you see the size decrease dramatically, but then the quality actually increasing or the battery life actually is getting much longer. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, at one point in my career, put in single chamber just for people that had complete heart block mm -hmm. that you know were older. And I can remember at that time, Medtronic, one of the companies, was developing uh, the ability to monitor glucoses, you know, and they they were using that at the same time, kind of experimentally. Mm -hmm. And so you you can actually you can there's this is going to keep. Expanding. Keep expanding, yep. And then thanks for people who are doing basic research, clinical trials. Every year, there are new things come up. And that's why another reason we have to keep learning because yeah, we need yeah. to keep up. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah that's probably... Uh, yeah, right now, right, right now, I see cardiology is kind of where gastroenterology was like maybe 10, 15 years ago. Where like they're coming out with a new toy all the time and people are learning and, yes. and expanding the possibilities for patients. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know listeners want to know the answer to this one. If I have a pacemaker, can I use a microwave? Yes, you can use microwave. Yes. And That's... then you don't need to worry about uh, household appliances. Airport is not an issue. You just need to tell them I have a pacemaker. Yeah. And it, even if it what it would just reset it to the factory settings, right? It wouldn't stop it from working. It wouldn't stop. Yes, it will. Like there is what we call a, a, a certain mode. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yes. Yeah. Um, what happens when we, if I have a pacemaker and I die, what happens? Does it keep beating my heart even though I'm not breathing? 
um, it will still send the electrical impulse, but at that time, the whole body shut down. So the, on the cellular level, it's not going to respond to the uh, pacemaker. Even if patients still on the monitor, you see the pacing spike, but it's not going to cause the heart muscle to contract anymore. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I don't have any more electrophysiology questions. I think we covered quite a bit today of really interesting information. But one last question. Why did you choose electrophysiology? This is really interesting field. You know, when I did uh, internal medicine, uh, cardiology is really amazing because this is specialty. You, you see the patient, evaluate, you form the hypothesis. You say, this is your problem. And you can actually prove yourself, whether do an EKG, echo, stress test, and you identify the problem and you can treat, fix the problem. And the electrophysiology is actually a step even above it because you're focusing so precise on the electrical system. And we have to be so accurate. Whatever ablation we do, like we have to be within, we're talking about millimeter of the focus. And it's amazing. And then this is one of the few specialty is curative. You can cure the problem. That Yeah, that's that's a deep sense of satisfaction. Yes. Yeah. You know, we, you're actually... It's, it's so often for on the internal medicine, you're just kind of managing chronic problems. You're not really making them go away yeah. or improve them. Yeah. Uh, that's just the nature of the business, I guess. Uh, and you you had a history of St. Luke's before you came here, right? You yes. worked as a hospitalist back in the day. Yeah. I yeah. Uh, I was a cardiology fellowship at yeah. that time. Yeah. And I came here. I was like, it was so busy here, <laughs> even at that time to do that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yes, yeah. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you for joining me. I know you're very busy, and uh, this was very interesting, uh, discussing the field of electrophysiology, and I'm sure our listeners are uh, grateful. Once again, this is Dr. Wee Wee Lee, cardiologist with St. Luke's Heart Care Clinic. To learn more, visit unipoint.org backslash heart care. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.